Hey biologist, Mr. Fod here. Today we are going to be talking about eukaryotic cells versus some prokaryotic cells. First up are the must-knows. We are going to be describing the function and or structure of our subcellular components and the organelles. Also, we will be explaining how these subcellular components and these organelles contribute to the overall function of our given cells. But first off, we need to talk about cell theory. Um, there's this is a, a collected body of work of knowledge that cells must be, by definition, the most individual and basic units of living organisms. So it's one of our eight characteristics of life that to be considered alive, that you must be made up of one or multiple cells. So there's a few other things that this theory then states. So as we mentioned, all living things must be made up of one or more cells. Cells have to be the basic unit. They uh, include all of the necessary structures and functions within living creatures, and it can then uh, have all eight of those eight characteristics of life as well. And all cells must come from other cells. Now, of course, this begs the question, so if all cells come from other cells, where did the first cell come from? Uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that for you, and that's not really us for, you know, up to up for us to discuss as of right at this moment, but it is a good question nonetheless. Um, but as, a, as the theory goes, we must have cells originating from other cells. So uh, let's get into the different types. Uh, as we mentioned, there are going to be prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Uh, so first off, if you are going to have, the main difference between these is that they are going to be membrane bound or not. Uh, in the case of our eukaryotic cells, that's like plants and animals, that is going to be, yes, we do have eukaryotic uh, membrane-bound organelles. However, if you do not have these membrane-bound organelles, you are then considered prokaryotic. These are typically like unicellular organisms, such as like bacteria is a great one, archaea bacteria. Uh, and the image over to the right is a pretty generic version of like a bacteria cell. Uh, and so you can see it's a lot more simplistic internally, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of functionality to it. And again, they are these unicellular organisms. So that's, the, again, the main difference between our prokaryotic cells and our eukaryotic cells are that our prokaryotic cells have no membrane-bound organelles, while eukaryotic cells do. So a quick little uh, tip here is that pro equals no and u equals yes. So that's how I've always remembered it. Pro equals no membrane-bound organelles. U equals yes membrane-bound organelles. So if you're wondering, well, what are these membrane-bound organelles that we are then going to be focusing on? Let's go ahead and break them down. Specifically, we're going to be talking about eukaryotic cells, which is the vast majority of our kingdom of life. Uh, and so we'll be talking about plants and animals. Uh, specifically, we'll be focusing on as well as um, a handful of other examples. Well, let's break down the eukaryotic cell structure. First off, probably uh, the most important thing is the membrane because this is basically what distinguishes inside the cell from outside the cell. Now, these cells really are is like floating sacks of liquid with things floating around with them that occasionally do stuff. So how do we distinguish cell from not cell? This is going to be the first line of defense. It's going to be the plasma membrane, sometimes it's referred to as, or the cell membrane. Um, this is a flexible boundary, and so it can then squish, and you can demonstrate this by using your own, you know, skin cells, which do have membranes as well, and they're very flexible, they're very squishy. Uh, they are then, again, going to separate internal from external. Now, these membranes do a handful of other things, as we are going to discuss later on in this, uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but basically, they allow the, the nutrients or things that are external to come internal or vice versa if you want things internal to move external. And so they allow some things in. We refer to this as selective permeability. So it's going to choose. It doesn't say everybody gets an all-access pass, but only certain things are allowed to pass through, whereas other things are going to be trapped and they may not pass through. Part of the reason why this is so important is that it's going to allow the living organisms to maintain a certain balance. So it wants to have certain levels of nutrients or certain things internally, or wants to remove wastes to get them external here. And this is all referring to one, again, of those eight characteristics of life, homeostasis. We want to maintain stable internal conditions. And if we get out of whack, if that homeostasis is not maintained, 
then life will cease to exist. Now we're going to go over just a brief overview of each organelles and then I have a review at the end of this that you can peruse at your leisure. Um, so first up is the nucleus. This is oftentimes referred to as the brain or the control center. Um, the most important thing here, however, is that it's going to contain our genetic information. So this is where all of our DNA is going to be housed. So this is where, um, you know, anytime we need anything done, we have to call on something from the nucleus to then uh, be moved external so that we can then use that information to process it. Uh, as we'll talk about again later down the road. Um, this is one of the largest organelles in the cell and it is generally located within plants and animals at the core or the center of the cell. Next is the chromatin. Um, this is going to determine a little bit uh, where the proteins are going to be made. So it's going to assist in the protein making process. And when we get into protein synthesis, we're gonna come back to this protein, uh, the chromatin. Uh, nucleolus is found internally. Uh, this is where our ribosomes specifically, if you recall, as we'll mention in a moment, ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. So it's going to help these ribosomes become constructed so that the ribosomes themselves can make additional proteins. As we just mentioned, ribosomes, the site of protein synthesis or the creation of our proteins. These are a little bit like factory workers and they are, again, the site of protein production. Um, interestingly enough, they're actually made up of RNA. So not DNA, the opposite single-stranded one with uracil, RNA is actually what they're made up of. Um, specifically, we refer to it as rRNA. Next up is the cytoplasm. This is like a fluid jelly-like substance that's on the inside of the cell. So this is basically where everything is suspended, kind of floating around, and it allows for ease of transport just so that things can then move in between the cell. Next up, we have the endoplasmic reticulum, sometimes referred to as ER for short because endoplasmic reticulum is kind of a mouthful. Um, this is an extensive uh, network of membranes, which we are going to go a little bit more in depth in the next PowerPoint slides as we talk about the endomembrane system. Um, but basically, there are two different versions. Either it could be rough or smooth, which means it's going to have ribosomes or not going to have some ribosomes. Easy way to remember this is that if you were to take your hand running along a desk or something, and oh, it's nice and smooth. There's no bumps, right? So it's nice and smooth. There's nothing there indicating, again, that there are, uh, there are no ribosomes it's going to be. Thus, we call it smooth ER uh, versus rough ER. Again, if you were to run your hand across the desk and you feel a bunch of bumps or something, you feel the ribosomes is what you would feel then. Golgi apparatus, this is going to play out with the endoplasmic reticulum eventually as it then sorts the proteins so that it, it can then send them to the appropriate location. Whether it's going to be internal inside the cell or external, it needs to leave the cell. And again, we'll cover that at the endomembrane system in the next notes. Lysosomes. Uh, this is the, they are digestive uh, enzymes basically on the inside of these. They're floating around and they're waiting just to break things down. Uh, analogous to like recycling plants or things that are going to be taken internal and they are going to be destroyed. Um, to break down lysosomes, to lyse means to split apart, which is why these are referred to as lysosomes because they are breaking down things by splitting them apart using these digestive enzymes to remove wastes and invading bacteria and things. Mitochondria, now I got a small bone to pick with this one. I'm gonna say this probably once and I don't think you shouldn't ever hear me say it again. So it's often referred to as the quote, powerhouse of the cell. Please, please don't ever say that. Oh, it is a huge pet peeve of mine. There's a few things that I'm going to attempt to fix our vocabulary and that is definitely one of them. Um, powerhouse, I don't know, it's vague. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, it, at its, you know, like surface level. But basically, what it actually is, it would be more analysis to say that it's like a power plant and powerhouse. Anyway, I'll get off that. So power plant, which means it's going to produce energy. So we got to feed it some things, as again, we'll talk about when we get to cell respiration, we have to feed it some fuel so that it can then be processed so we can make our energy uh, in the form of ATP is what we're going to get our energy, energy out of. 
Next up, we have the vacuoles. These are going to be like storage closets is the best way to put it. They're going to house things, food, sugar, water, waste products, whatever it is. So if the body doesn't need to use it right at the moment, but it might need it a little bit later, dump it in the vacuole. It can retrieve it later if it needs to. Now we're going to talk about plant cells for just a moment. Uh, everything up until this point has been specific to animal cells. And plant cells, albeit also eukaryotic, but they're going to contain specific certain uh, organelles or some subtle differences between our ants our, our, our animal cells. So you'll notice that in this image of the plant cell that the vacuole I'll point out before moving on uh, is going to have a much larger vacuole. This is sometimes referred to as a central vacuole. So the vacuole is actually going to take up the vast majority of the plant cell. In fact, it even pushes all the rest of the organelles kind of externally, uh, kind of pushes them around a little bit because that's how much space it actually takes it up. So this image actually doesn't do it quite as much justice, but those vacuoles do get rather large. Uh, just a note before moving on. Uh, additionally, plant cells are going to have these cell walls. They're very rigid. It's what helps give them their structure. So plants don't have bones. And, um, you know, if you were to think about ourselves and if we were to remove all of our bones, you would basically collapse into a pile of mush and organs and things, which is kind of gross to think about, but true. So plants don't have that. They don't have bones. So how do they hold themselves up? They have to have these rigid structures, these cell walls. Additionally, they're going to produce their, their energy in a different fashion. That's not to say that they won't have um, mitochondria capabilities. They definitely do. However, um, something that they will have that animal cells don't have are these chloroplasts. So they can do this photosynthesis process, and again, we'll get to that later, um, but they can use sunlight to capture the energy and then convert it into chemical energy, ultimately resulting, if needed, ATP. Chlorophyll is part of these, chloropla uh, these chloroplasts, which allow them to then capture that sunlight's energy to then transport it through a system of photosystems so that they can then process it into energy. Plastids, these are other things that are found specifically within plant cells that allow them to store things um, such as food, for instance, within internal structures of the plant. Here are a few uh, slides of brief summary. I will again let you go through this on your own time though. Thank you all for watching. Please let me know if you have any more questions.